Hello, this is Aaron and welcome back to the show. I'm very excited today to have special guest artist, Arthur Kwan Lee. Uh, Arthur is a New York City based artist. You can find out more about him and his work at ArthurKwanLee.com. Uh, he had a great career going in New York, was getting solo gallery shows in New York City at multiple galleries. You can Google this, verify that it's true. It is. It's very hard to get any gallery show, much less a solo show. And then he ran into some political problems along the way. Maybe we'll talk about that. Uh, he's also a Christian, which is something you don't often see in this elite art world. So Arthur, I'm just so happy that you uh, came to talk with us today. Thank you for having me on, Aaron. Um, it's, it's a pleasure. Uh, you know, a few days ago when we talked, or a couple weeks ago, you made a statement that I'm a conservative for purely aesthetic reasons. And as we were started getting going in the show, or just in the green room uh, talking, you, you've kind of evolved a little bit, but I'm, I'm interested in, in how aesthetics kind of shapes your, I don't know if it's your politics, or just your general view of the world. Like, why is aesthetics so important to kind of how you feel about being a conservative or whatever you'd call yourself now? <clears throat> yeah, you know, I think that when you look at most conservative figures who are speaking in our cultural front, they're obsessed with the spreadsheeting and the pie charts and the data. And I think we do need those stoic men who are stacking red pill evidence. But I am, my conservative predilections are based on my attraction to traditional aesthetics. In other words, I'm more a conservative because I would rather have my daughter look like a decent lady than a radical left septum pierce 400 pound protesting uh, college student, right? So, and, and that's aesthetic. And it's important to understand that our aesthetics are superior. And they are. They just mm -hmm. are. Because our aesthetics are based on pedagogical standards because we are, as conservatives, people who are preserving tradition. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the left, they are pushing um, aesthetic relativity. So mm -hmm. that's just a very polarized view on art that, that we need to put up in the forefront. Yeah. What, what is the role of art in the world? Or what well, should it be? Maybe well, what well, should well, the role of art Historically, the function of art you know, it was really the wealthy, the, the upper class of society who were venerating certain ideals to, and of course, there's, there's a lot of nepotism associated with that as well. But nonetheless, um, there's also good in it. We can't always throw the baby out with the bathwater. The function of art is, is the fortification of values that we want to preserve and stand up for. And that's why the peak of the greatest masterpieces of art, all the artists of those, t of, you know, those masterclass works regarded themselves as spiritual servants. And there's, there's wisdom associated with that. And I think that when Leonardo da Vinci stated that art is when the spirit, not the body, picks up the brush, hmm. I think he meant that more as a instruction, you know? And I think too many artists today, they, they're obsessed with this vanity of, of, um, you know, it's all about them. It's all about, it's purely self-expression. It is self-expression, but you're supposed to be aiming towards the logos. Hmm. So, so art, can I phrase this as, you know, art was designed, historically conceived to support the uh, spiritual sacred values that underpinned Ideally. society. Yeah. How, how Absolutely. much did those values vary from place to place? Well, you know, it, it's funny because we, we spoke a little bit about this before we went live, and there's this idea of, um, you know, I don't believe all roads lead to the same ro to, to the same place, but if you Google my name, just click images, mm -hmm. you'll see a lot of pantheism. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, uh, this idea that the Joseph Campbell, a little bit mm -hmm. Jungian, New Age sort of interpretation that all religions are saying the same thing, this, that, and the other. Uh, that was me kind of playing nice and go, be, meeting halfway. And, you know, words are packages, right? It, we have to be very, you know, I, I avoid using the word spiritual now, you know, because how many girls did you meet in college who always say that I'm spiritual, mm. right? This is, spiritual can mean something dark. Spiritual can mean 
um, Islamic martyrdom. Spiritual can mean the boundary dissolving aesthetic of, of Buddhism and Hinduism that, that calls them community and Alex Gray, that sort of aesthetic. I want to be specific about my words. So now I'm really interested in Christian iconography and, and that sort of um, symbolic imagery. So if you look at all these different cultures, they were trying to point towards that direction. But I think that at some point you get, you want to, you know, you want to become a little bit more specific with your language. So mm -hmm. I, I think these different cultures are trying to point towards this idea of a transcendent morality, but mm -hmm. that's still a very vague language. Mm -hmm. And in my own evolution, I'm now leaning towards more being, you know, again, the next thing I'm working on is a biblical series with that in mind, you know, mm -hmm. and I don't think I would have been able to even come to that conclusion towards the production of this sort of series if I was still under this this woke gallery structure and the culture associated with it. I don't think mm -hmm. I would have been able to reach that point. Mm -hmm. You know, you mentioned, you know, aesthetics and beauty, traditional beauty. If there's one thing you're not allowed to do in the art world today, it's create anything that's traditionally beautiful. I think in, in a lot of ways, um, sort of anything that's too traditional or is too beautiful is rejected. It's sort of viewed as, um, I don't know what it's viewed as, maybe it's treated as like it's not serious art uh, or, or whatever. And what happened to the art world that we went from these extraordinarily beautiful um, paintings or sculptures or architecture to something that seems a bit, you know, almost to uh, prefer something that's ugly or transgressive, that this transgression against the beautiful became one of the touchstones of art. Yeah, you know, one of the great powers that we have on our side is beauty. And that's why they're trying to lower the aesthetic standards by normalizing decadence and removing reverence. You know, we live in a, we're in a very irreverent time for a reason. Because I will tell you that the left is damn effective when it comes to the cultural fight. Mm -hmm. Because they recognize, you know, we, we will say on the right that politics is downstream from culture. But we'll just kind of say it as this empty mantra. Mm -hmm. The left, they you know, they have ownership of what I call the big five, big tech, academia, the art gallery, Hollywood, and entertainment. They, they own that. They are the gatekeepers. So if you want to be successful in the industry, you need to kind of play with the social camouflage. You need to, you need to play by their rules. And one of the things they've done in the gallery, for example, to get more specific to my industry, is the, the merging of postmodern academia with art galleries. So you, it's a strange matriarch where you need to, um, you know, it's uh, the, the, the artists are not people pleasers rather than trying to pursue art that genuinely resonates with them. And they're, be, they're being rewarded for that, right? Because they're getting the exhibitions and being, being spotlighted for that reason. And you know, it, historically, it's if you look at art education and training, it was atelier training. Atelier training was like any other trade school. Atelier training basically is a master and his apprentice, right? You go to learn the trade, and you develop the skill set that's passed down to you, and you create your own voice with it, right? Learn the rules to break the rules, like anything else. Mm -hmm. And what's happened now is, is you have to go to art school. Art school was created by John Murphy of the Frankfurt School. He wrote Art and the Social World. It was a study into aesthetic, um, uh, Marxist aesthetics. And he wrote very clearly that art should serve as a political arm rather than a religious one. So he understood, looking at art history, that we need to win the culture and have it under our belt here so that, you know, look, because the reality is everyone's going to look at, especially the, the young generation looking at, they're just going to look at the art. They're not going to. They're not going to look at pew polling or numbers in the BLS, mm -hmm. anything of that sort. They're going to look at the arts. And if they're the ones having all the, uh, the creative force on their side, that's going to be attractive. And that was done intentionally. And I think now that people are starting to see that um, we're losing any semblance of you know, depth and, and 
and beauty in the wisdom of it. Um, you know, there's this discontentment that our society has, and art was one of the ways to satiate that, but not today. So it, it, it feels off, right? And I think that's where we're kind of coming into the fold, where now we can have artists that are independent, that don't need to work with the wokeism in the galleries today, which is really bad here in New York City. I'll tell you that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, the, the art world seems to be in kind of a very small, incestuous world. There's only, there's like a limited number of people, you know, really rich guys who collect the art. I, I read a study, it was probably last year, they studied the careers of all these different artists and like who became the, you know, the high dollar uh, earners. And they basically said, you have to get an exhibition in one of these seven galleries at a certain phase in your life. And if you don't, basically you're going to be frozen out. And so it's like these clicks and these networks. If you're not part of these networks, then you're sort of like that. So you have to play ball with them um, or you're not going to get anywhere. Yeah, the only, the only problem with that is that is that th those those the name the people you can list on those names many of them are you know um they're very anti-american elitist that's the mm -hmm. problem with a lot of them um i can't speak for all of them but i have been invited to work with certain galleries and there was so many red flags just walking in just, just having sushi with some of these guys mm -hmm. you know what i mean <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and like this is the first year I've been to invited to Art Basel every year. You know, my, it just happened in Miami this weekend, mm -hmm. right? Some people are still partying, and I used to go every year. And yeah, you exhibited Art, Art Basel in Miami. Yeah, 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 M multiple times. You know, and this is the first time I've been invited to work two events, and I said no, because I I know what that entails. It's not just, you're not just going to a party, or you're not just going to show your art. There's always other stuff where they're trying to compromise you in one way or the other. You know, especially. For me, it's always the, the ideological turnoff, and my my tolerance for that is just so thin now that you know I don't need to. I don't need to. You know, I'm um, I'm an independent artist now, right? And it's I'm free of those constraints. But it it it's it's telling. It's very telling. It's one thing to that the art we don't like the art or we think it's no good. It's ugly. So much of the art today appears to have no particular technical skill behind it so you'll go to the museum and you'll see like a solid black canvas that's like a famous one yep or Casimir those... Malevich, yep black square right, right. It, looks, there... it looks like one of those sound squares behind you actually right <laughs> and then like there was this guy who like put his own uh excrement in a can and and yep. i seem to i seem to recall there was a guy who literally just stenciled the word rat on a poster board three times and sold it for a bunch of money and like how is it that stuff that you know seems to have no like even no technical excellence is like <clears throat> or requires no particular skill to have done you could have just gone to the home depot and got some black paint and a roller and put it on a can how, how does that stuff get put out as the, the greatest thing ever well often we're not supposed to say this even though it's pretty obvious elephant in the room going on right now which is there's money laundering and tax write-offs going on Hmm. That's a big part of it because remember art. The, the well, sales, even the Biden administration right, just said right. that today. I mean, he said like the last couple of days. There's like art world is full of money laundering. Yeah, one. Yeah, there's a lot of that going on. I've been offered those those situations. I mean, hmm. you're vetted. They'll, they'll never say it up front, but you know what they're implying, right? Mm -hmm. But my thing is that um, that's definitely going on. That's the first part of it. Um, but there's also we have to look at why that's able to be pulled off in the first place. The reason why that's able to be pulled off is because only a person or only the, 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 the status quo that believes gender is a social construct will believe a banana duct taped to a wall is, is a fabulous art, right? And I had a, uh, this is a pretty funny story. I had a dinner with this artist. She's doing very well. I'm not going to name her here because she's actually a very nice person. But her art is crap, and mm -hmm. we're, we're friendly. It's okay, you know. Like we're close enough where she knows my opinion, and we can still get along in other matters. But her art, she's making these little cartoon like drawings of animals. They're very flat. It's 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 a single line. Also, um, we had dinner together, and she says, you know, like I won Artist of the Year in twenty twenty, 
and 2016 in uh, the DMV. Mm -hmm. So I, I have my pool and people have wanted me to look at their art, this and the other. We're sitting down together. She says, Arthur, what do you think of my art? Right? Just honestly, what do you think of my, you know, what I'm doing? I'm, I'm selling pretty well right now lately. And I told her, you know, I, I, you know, I've been drinking a little bit, so I don't, I might be a little mm -hmm. bit more blunt. <laughs> I said, um, I can make a bet with you. Okay. I can master what you do. Maybe a two, two, three days. Hmm. And, I, and I'll give you several years to try to do what I do. Mm -hmm. Would you take that bet? Would you? Mm -hmm. And she just looked at me like, that wasn't nice. <laughs> <laughs> but the reality is, you're, you're right. And I'm sorry to say this, but if you see this vague, miasmic production of art on the walls, that was probably produced by somebody on the radical left. Hmm. Maybe not radical, but definitely on the left. Right, mm -hmm. because they just want to have that. So, like, like this is what I'm saying. The aesthetics are connected. The aesthetic, you know, your beliefs are going to matriculate into your hands to what you produce. Right, mm -hmm. it's connected. Right, it's, the nucleus is always your heart, and that's what's being produced. And look, I was raised under a military veteran, pastor, mm -hmm. <laughs> old school Korean man that that. I was a benevolent, loving, patriarchal kind of guy. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, under those conditions, if I'm studying art, I'm going to, you know, it, it kind of speaks for itself, actually. That context sort of explains a lot of um, the imagery behind my work as well, actually. Mm. Well, we've been talking a little over 15 minutes, and so I actually do want to show people your art. Uh, so we could talk okay. about that a little bit. So I'm going to interrupt our conversation at, at periodically to show some of your art. For those of you who are listening on the audio podcast, you might want to click over to YouTube uh, so you can actually see it. Uh, and I will throw a link to that in the show notes uh, should you check it out. So I'm going to pull up this piece here. Um, yeah, and this is, this is one of your pieces. And I, I, I find your work very visually striking uh, in the sense that it's got this color scheme, I can't quite, uh, I can't quite put my finger on, uh, and uh, all all of your pieces are just immediately visually striking. Uh, but what can, what can you tell us about this one? You know, if there's one word that describes my work across the board, it's intensity. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of intensity going on. So this is titled uh, maybe very uh, lofty. But uh, all and everything. <laughs> and I think it's because the daunting amount of time it took me to produce this. It's a very large painting. And what we have How here, big is the painting physically? Uh, we're talking like hmm, what, um, six feet. Uh, it's, it, yeah, it's, it's around, I think it's around six feet wide, wide and five and a half feet tall, something mm. of that sort. Um, and what we have here is we have all the celestial figures at the top here, angelic figures, different celestial mythological gods. I see like a, a Egyptian pharaoh or something like that there. And... Yeah, so, so, so these are all figures that are regarded as holy, transcendent, above us. And on the middle area, these are all warrior-like figures. Mm -hmm. Kimishin, Achilles with the shield, Beowulf in the center holding the... the holding the beast away from him when he entered the cavern. Mm. Um, medieval knights. And, and the bottom is the underworld. You know, mm -hmm. so these are all placed very intentionally. Mm -hmm. And this is my attempt to do the Joseph Campbell approach of mm -hmm. looking at all these different vantage points and say the same thing and, and find the universality. That was sort of the uh, excavation visually here. And this, this painting has gotten me um, quite a bit of PR and attention. Mm -hmm. I've actually refused to sell this to several mm -hmm. collectors as well because of the challenge that I had just to produce this. Yeah, I mean, there are all these figures, it's really interesting trying to figure out what some of them are. Um, but yeah. again, they're, they're very striking images. And I think a lot of the art that we're going to look at today has that sort of, uh, as you said, Jungian or Campbellian um, sense. And it shows sort of the constancy or the universality of some of these things across time mm. and space yes. um, that, that, that sort of has that. It, it's, it's really... Um, yeah, the archetypes. 
Yeah, the ar archetype, very arch that's, a, that's the right word. That's the right word. So uh, let me uh, take this offline for now and uh, bring us back. So that was, yeah. a, I was that's like that's one of your pieces, and um, you know, again, we'll look at some different ones. I, I tried to pick some of the ones that had slightly different styles as well, okay. but they're all very visually striking. You know, one of the things. Uh, that, well, I know what else is. So, uh, Tom Wolfe wrote an essay, a famous essay called "The Painted Word," in which he made this argument that modern art, and I think he's kind of talking about you know early 20th century through to say, you know, the 19, 1970s um, was really a, the, the, there was sort of a manifesto or sort of a, a intellectual theory that was articulated. And then the art was created to be an embodiment of an intellectual theory. Um, not, not that the theory was created by studying the art or something like that, that there was this sort of primacy of theory and the art was designed to sort of justify or express the theory. Do you agree with that? I mean, Tom Wolfe's just just a funny guy, and so he makes everything sound I, believable. I, mean, I don't. I don't think anyone <laughs> encapsulated New York City or predicted <laughs> what New York would become better than Tom Wolfe. <laughs> I mean, I, and and he's right. He calls it the culture bird, mm -hmm. right? This idea that Rosenberg, Greenberg, all of these art critics, and Basically, all the critics would become the people who are determining what is good art, and mm -hmm. the artists would inevitably try to please them and fit to that image to showcase in those galleries. Mm -hmm. And he's correct, obviously, because that's what's going on. Because what are the three sacred cows today? BLM, LGBTQ, whatever you want to call it, and feminist misandry. Those are like the three works. If you can, if you're producing work that's venerating those ideals, you, mm -hmm. you're going to get shown pretty easily. You know what I mean? You're going to, it's, it's, it, and, um, yeah. And, and he was right to, to notice that. And it's pretty funny. The way he discovered this was he, you know, as a Manhattanite, he walked into this gallery in his neighborhood mm -hmm. and he saw these empty, these empty canvases. So he walked in and he's a lover of art galleries as well. I mean, he loves real art. He loves mm -hmm. real art, legitimate art. And he asked the girl up front with her, you know, wearing all black, like me, I guess, right now, with a little ponytail, art student kind of girl who just graduated, who's just, just attractive enough that you're going to talk to her, but, you know, kind of has like this Karen feeling a little bit. And he says, hey, you know, um, who's showing their art in this? Like, like, this artist is thinking way ahead of it. Like they're already planning for this exhibition. Usually an artist will produce a body of work and the curator or the, or the dealer will come and they'll select the works and they'll have a conversation. It's a whole process. This artist is already planning the series ahead of time and these are large canvases. This is amazing. Who is the artist? And, and when is the show going to be ready? Mm -hmm. And the young lady says, no, this is the show. <laughs> this is the art show. And he goes, wait, he, perplexed. He's like, what are you talking about? He's like, she, and then she looks at him and goes, oh, you haven't read Clement Greenberg. <laughs> you don't understand. This is there's a purity here going on. Mm. And he goes, okay, okay. So he gets a book by Greenberg. He goes upstairs to his loft and he reads it. And he comes back down and he totally trolls the girl. I mean, again, he's a funny guy. He <laughs> trolls her and he goes, oh, it's the flatness of the medium that's making it, the purity of paint itself. It's no longer about rendering reality. The paint is so pure that it's just. Mm. De facto, the value is just in the commitment to the paint. I get it now. And he's trolling her, right? Mm -hmm. This is before trolling was trolling. Mm -hmm. And the girl couldn't tell the difference. She said, <laughs> now you understand. It, let me know if you're interested in any other works. And he realized right there, boom, there's something to write about here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, 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 and he was right because that's, that is what's going on in the galleries, you know. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've been proposed to do an art show with a gallery because I'm Asian. You know what I mean? Like, like, and my work is not about being Asian at all, right? Mm -hmm. My work is actually about not the external identities. And I've been told during the whole stop Asian hate thing, mm -hmm. I remember during that, you know, a gallery asked me, hey, why don't we do a show with my Black Lives Matter artists? And then we can do like stop Asian hate and Black Lives Matter together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about that? Are you excited? And I, I, I remember the, 
this is just one of many moments again because I burned many bridges. <laughs> Aaron, I, I I remember I I told her I said, I think it's very odd that blacks assaulting Asians based on race is white supremacy. And and she just looked at me like, uh, what? <laughs> and, and, but so so it's just all these sort of situations where the gallery is just an extended arm of the state, basically, you know, and um. Again, I've often said we live under a matriarch, right? Mm -hmm. So the gallery is just mommy gallery right now. You know, the way, uh, um, yeah, it, it, it's like they, they, they think they're like, uh, they think they know art. They don't. They know politics and they're forcing the artist to be political. You know, there's always been this line out there. You know, it, obviously the Europeans felt this way, but a lot of Americans have as well saying that Americans have always had trash aesthetics, that this is a country without culture, you know, without arts, et cetera. Uh, the essayist H.L. Mencken, uh, one of his uh, famous essays is called The Libido for the Ugly. And he was talking right. about uh, this Westmoreland County, Pennsylvania, outside of Pittsburgh, and just how ugly everything is. And his conclusion was these people like ugly, that the average American kind of likes ugly. Is America really as bad as people say? No, we have so no way. You know, you know. Um, I think the proliferation of ugly. I, I mean, again, I hate to keep bringing back this antithetical nature of our, the polarization of our politics, but I mean, but but they're the ones who are allowing this to be on the forefront of uh, um, the aesthetics of this country, right? Who are they spotlighting? There's so much talent. There's, I mean. All we have to do is look at the Genesis Council, right? Mm -hmm. Like well, what, I, I don't what is what is the Genesis Council? It's the only artist collected that I started that are basically creatives, um, however they identify politically, that are not on the radical left, um, who who understand that you know and appreciate art histor art history and are against postmodern aesthetics. And it's it's you know it's just like we're not friends just of Abe artists. in Hollywood or whatever they call them like the uh, the kind of underground is it kind of underground there? It, it's pretty. It's like there's a Fight Club ish feeling about it, yeah. but I, I will say that like like we're not like we're not trying to be like we're not trying to be off the radar, but you know we're there, there's no place for artists who want to preserve tradition, and there's no place for artists who want to yield their masculinity as well. There isn't. I mean, I'll, I'll tell you right now that, like, we have a filmmaker in the fold, and he told me that whenever he goes to these actors' guilds to hire um, people for his films, he's always told, you know, no, you need to have, uh, we need to change the cast. We're in the, we're in a different time, and because he makes classic hero films, right? Mm -hmm. So I think the medium is actually not the point. It's not about the medium specificity. It's we're living in a under a cultural fabric that wants us to play this virtue signaling nonsense because they really just want to control us which again is it i keep reiterating like i i think the bomb here is that you know we're living under a matriarchy i really think so hmm. i really do believe so um what's wrong with conservative art i mean when i see art that's produced by people who are politically conservative um it's always bad, you know, uh, and, and that's, a, that's a little point, but like, you know, especially like Christian art, it's like the music is super cheesy. The architecture is just like some box. There's no edge. You know, it's like, you know, schlock books, um, not very well done. And if, you know, even watch like these films that'll come out, Christian films, they're always kind of cheesy. They just, they don't pop. Like, why, why is it that, you know, these people who say, you know, we believe in truth, goodness, beauty, can't actually produce any beauty. <laughs> I, I, to me, that's like a, that tells me there's something wrong. I, I, I don't know what's going on. What's, what's your take on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I will say I have a problem with the, like the whole like good old boy, like, like feeling of uh, aesthetics that I see, which is um, like, I'm not into any of that actually. Like, for example, like my art is not activist art. Mm -hmm. I'm not politically, I'm not making political art. Mm -hmm. I'm just in the political landscape because they pushed me to the right. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like I didn't even pick the right. They mm -hmm. just gave me no choice. I, I just eventually found myself cornered and I grabbed some swords. Mm -hmm. Right. 
So my art is not activist art. It's it's definitely more on the religious end of the spectrum. But with that said, um, you're you're right. Like um, th there's. I, I, I gotta say, like I, I think it's more circumstantial because I've thought mm -hmm. about this sometime. Because I know so many artists who are aligned with our values here. You know what I mean? Like, like all mm -hmm. the things we believe in as Christian men, Aaron. Mm -hmm. like we, we are standing up for what we know is right in our heart, and we backed it up, not just biblically, but just with our family values, right? Like, like we mm -hmm. believe in all these things, and they're making work that even has an edge, you know, because of the personal expression to it too. But I'll say that they don't have a place to go. That's really why I started the council, really. I'm not pitching anything. I'm just telling mm. you, realistically, there is not a place for us to consolidate. Um, all these young artists that are lining up to showcase in galleries are going to come into a rude awakening. Mm -hmm. They're going to be fed to the Leviathan here. And it's going to compromise their artistic integrity and the value of their actual work. And I think it's... Um, the solution is we need to get a mean streak. Mm. You know, we need a mean streak. I think we're too busy apologizing for what we believe in. And our strategy, whether it's in the arts or outside for so long, has been to hope the other side has a modicum of conscientiousness and decency and will step away and go, oh, let me hear what they have to say. Mm -hmm. That's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. You know, they give them an inch to take a mile. And I think we need to develop a mean streak and understand that, you know, um, w you know, we can play with fire and produce some stellar work, you know? Mm -hmm. and, you know, this is why the Kanye phenomenon was such a big deal. I'm not a hip-hop guy personally. Mm -hmm. I'm really not. But I can see why because he's so atypical when he, when he produced – you know, when he was um, about to become the first rap billionaire, or whatever, mm -hmm. and he's getting all of these temptations and all these people trying to compromise him and the, the elite contacting him during that moment. And again, Kanye is not sexy with his articulation at all, mm -hmm. right? But during that time, he says, No, Jesus is king. He makes that mm -hmm. album. That's already something. Um, and also, he's not an atypical. Christian artists at that mind, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I think we need to allow a little bit of a mean streak and we, we should be allowed to play with fire. The artists should be allowed to play with fire a little bit and, and, and carry their sword too, right? Yeah, I thought the Kanye one was interesting because, you know, uh, in kind of this white upper middle class uh, evangelical world, you got all these people who want to be winsome and they're trying to like, all, you know, all this stuff and you know, we don't want to be, you know, Christian nationalist, triumphalist. And then Kanye makes this album unapologetic. Jesus is king, period. Yeah. You know, it's like yeah. you, you wouldn't see these pastors make a statement like that in public. It was, it was sort of, I, I think, I, I an in-your-face. Say that. Yeah, I, I always just repeat that still because, like, I mean, obviously everyone's been saying that before he used it as a title name for an album. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I just, it just rolls off the tongue beautifully. Jesus mm -hmm. is king. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it works, yeah. Yeah. So I think you know a lot of these like dissident right guys, or at least you know who they are. And yeah. there's this guy out there, the Bronze Age pervert. Mm -hmm. um, and he makes this argument around aesthetics that I'm not sure I fully understand. I'm not the expert on his work. But he's like, look, the revolution that we're looking for is an aesthetic revolution, first and foremost. It is not... In a, you know, an ideological revolution or a uh, political revolution, but we need to have we need to be led by a revolution in aesthetics. Uh, not that I'm asking you to you know endorse what he says per se, but I'm wondering how you think about that, like the primacy of aesthetics. I, I I've, I've been saying this for mm -hmm. a long time, brother. So, so Aaron, I I absolutely agree. I I think that uh, I I get excited. I think there's so much novelty associated with people who are preserving tradition, picking up a brush mm -hmm. or welding or getting on a stage and grabbing a mic. Mm -hmm. It's again, it's not so much the, the, the medium, but it's the foundation of truth seeking seeker of truth as, as, as the foundation of being an artist and then finding your medium. 
And I, and I do believe people like to say, oh, not everyone can be an artist. I think everyone has a, a form of being uh, creative and, and expressive. I, I don't know what shape that is, but I do believe everyone has a creative medium. It's just finding out what that is. You know, hell, you could be a comedian listening, mm-hmm. or you could you could be a uh, a poet or a dancer. Who knows? But I think it's enough to just understand here that romanticism is nested in traditionality in the first place, mm-hmm. right? That's what romanticism is, and, and and we don't have to do the first mistake that the Daily Wire made. Mm-hmm. You which, know which the, what? Well, 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 when they first started, when they were like releasing their films and, and, and they produced a record label, I was like, right on. You're getting into culture. That's beautiful. That's just what I want to see. But with that said, you know, somebody sent me like a clip of part of the film. It's something like someone's r- like running over to like this cabin and then the guy grabs his gun, looks at his daughter and goes, this is my second American right. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, it's too oh, it's cringy. It's like Black like, Rifle Coffee or something like that. Oh my God. That's like if I painted bald eagles in red, white, and blue yeah. with like with the Statue of Liberty in the back. Mm-hmm. It's like I'm obliquely trying to be political rather than being a real artist. Mm-hmm. A true artist who's a dissident artist. We talked about dissident artists. A dissident artist historically, and that applies today too, mm-hmm. because this is a universal thing I'm saying. You are against collectivism. Mm-hmm. You are against collectivism. That's the bottom line, right? And if you're gonna be, a, if you're gonna do it in your own way, you got to really stand up as an individual, find your medium, and make the best art you can, and, and speak up in conjunction to what you're doing. Like I'm, I'm. This is what I'm, I'm trying to talk to talk, man. Like I'm not mm. only making this work. I'm gonna say what I believe, and if it gets mm. people offended, as it has been, good. You know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, let me put up another piece of your art here. I'm gonna have to uh, do something a little. Uh, t- Okay. Okay. Ah, oh, yes. Here's another one for us here uh, that again I think is quite striking. It appears to be uh, some type of dragons or something like that uh, around various women. Um, tell tell us about this piece. Absolutely. Um, a lot of the strokes here were actually this man influenced my work actually quite a bit too a gentleman by the name of leonid afromov he uses mm-hmm. he's a palette knife painter who does these impressionistic sort of strokes with mm-hmm. saturated colors as well but, but uh so what you're seeing here there's two central figures in this composition mm-hmm. one is guardian food dog there are those little statues that in east asia elders give to their grandchildren or children when they purchase new homes so they can place it in front of their homes because they symbolize guarding familial cohesion. Mm-hmm. And these little ghoulish figurines, they love human beings. They look scary, but that's only because in Eastern mythology and, and mm-hmm. in iconography, there's a lot of figures who are protectors and they're supposed to look ghoulish so that they can scare away mm-hmm. uh, more evildoers. Mm-hmm. And then in conjunction to that, we have the Virgin Mary. Mm-hmm. Or different forms of, of the of the Madonna, mm-hmm. and when you stack both of these together symbiotically, it's this idea that any society that does not defend and preserve the archetype of the mother and child inevitably falls into hell. Mm. And this is something that I was really exploring with different cultures, and it's so fascinating that the aesthetics are so polar opposite. Look at look at how different they are from one another. Mm-hmm. There's this gargoyle-like face with these sharp teeth, and then this right. woman with her eyes closed and chastity, but they're representing the same idea. Mm-hmm. And it's really interesting showing that spectrum onto one canvas, and that's sort of what I was exploring. And this is now in a private collection as well. Wow, that's and again another very striking piece. Um, you look at them, you're like, wow, that that really it really grabs your attention um, uh, in a lot of ways. Yeah. Uh, you know. You were you you mentioned before your dad was a traditional Presbyterian pastor, you know Korean, uh, but at one point you were an atheist. So how did you end up an atheist, and how did you get out of that? What changed that for you? Oh man, that that was a journey for me. You know, um, 
I was kind of a late bloomer in regards to my ritual defiance of authority. You know, so when I went to college and I was surrounded by all these radical leftists in Washington, D.C., I was blending in the social camouflage game here. And I think being surrounded by these kind of woke people, make, like the osmosis of such bitter and angry people, it started to make me also resentful that mm. I'm sacrificing my future with these huge student loans, going to this education, and I'm not getting anything of value, and I'm actually just getting poisoned and the only education I'm getting is learning to blend in and tolerate other people's BS. I think there was like an underlying resentment going on there. And at that time, my work was, I already had an interest in philosophy and religion just growing up under that household. But as Tom Wolf, Wolf talks about, in that sort of subculture, you're kind of keeping up with them and, and following under the guise of those arbiters. So I started to produce work in that spirit of more about me and self-expression and all this stuff. And naturally speaking, it pulled me away from uh, Christian thinking quite a bit. So there was like a prodigal son thing going on here. And I started to value and pride myself in being this new materialist atheist. I was listening to, I'm like, I listen to Sam Harris and Richard Dawkins. Oh boy. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> you know, and uh, all, all this, um, it, it was, you know, most people of this, I mean, look, they're just addicted to this intellectual high, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm an intellectual. But here's a funny thing. When I was privately by myself, right? Mm -hmm. This is where you know where the mirror is going on. Not publicly, not the mask, not the ego. When I was by myself, the artwork I was looking at, it's like I'm looking at like a porn magazine by myself. The, the, the art I was looking at in, in, um, in awe was religious art. And I could not deny the power behind it. So this is like an artistic journey that's that's sort of like the like my religious my 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 religious realizations were sort of spearheaded by me trying to find my voice as a painter. Mm -hmm. So there's a prodigal son thing going on here. Mm -hmm. So I was looking at this beautiful Christian icons and then the way the Russians took the Byzantine Christian iconographist painters and they mm -hmm. stepped it up with this all amazing beatific beauty. And I couldn't deny it. there was a, there was a superiority in regards to the excellence. There just was, mm -hmm. you know? So I was like, what's going on here? Like, why is it that I'm literally having dreams when I fall asleep about Christian art and I'm telling people that I'm an atheist? Mm -hmm. Like th there's a dissonance in there going on. And I came to realize that there's a big difference between material scientific truth and moral truth. And I was, you know, when you're an atheist, you're kind of functioning as this, with this a priori assumption that the universe is a fully automatic model. Mm -hmm. And everyone is going to, uh, with maturation, you develop a moral philosophy and a compass. And there's this, there's this incredible assumption associated with that. And... For me, I know this is going to sound kind of lofty and dramatic, but I realized I discovered Christ in silence just on my own. I just, it was more of a feeling I felt in my belly. And I realized that, that living that lie, right, mm -hmm. in the art world, telling, having pride as this atheist intellectual, but then at the same time studying history, mm -hmm. delving into the material and seeing that, the ferry boat that gets you to this other island of exhausted resources, right, mm -hmm. was was Judeo-Christian values and this masculine romanticism associated with it. Mm -hmm. And here I am just hacking down this method of transportation in pride. Mm -hmm. and, and it's almost like you're ignoring all the, the sacrifice and wisdom that undergirds what you're taking advantage from. I almost feel like being an atheist today and being a cocky atheist at that is like the ultimate privilege. Mm -hmm. It's like it's like your parents worked so hard for you and now you, you know it's almost to the point where where your parents had nothing, they sacrificed everything to get you where you are and now 
it's so easy to say you're an atheist because you didn't have to undergo anything. You right. know what I'm saying? It, 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 I think psycho, I'm trying to articulate the psychological process as to how I came to discover Christ in my life. Hmm. And, yeah, and I think, I'm, I think I'm a pragmatist because it just worked for me. <laughs> it, it worked. Mm -hmm. And because it worked, I started to look at it from a bird's eye view sociologically. And, I, and the first thing I saw is the percentage of atheists that vote for bigger government. Hmm. And I couldn't help but realize that, oh, you know what? Everyone's religious. It's mm -hmm. just a matter of those who are willing to acknowledge it and embody it publicly and, and declare this. I am a Christian. You know, it's, it's a very different thing to do so. Mm -hmm. And I came to realize that everyone's actually religious, but at least the Christians admit it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and I do think, you know, everybody's experience um, with Christ, I think, is different, that he, he reaches people in different ways. And I think sometimes we, particularly if you're Protestant, people tend to devalue the aesthetics. Um, yeah, You know, it's definitely. interesting, like, the, in the Reformed, like, the Reformed tradition was always very anti-aesthetic, I think, for a lot of things. Yep. They stripped all the churches, and... You know that's why you know I'm you know I'm a Presbyterian and I I, I would call myself basically Reformed, but I I'm totally not uh, I'm not totally sold on it in the sense that I feel like there's dimensions like the aesthetic dimension is missing from that. It's too austere and intellectual. Oh my god! It's too intellectualized, too much of an answer for everything. There's all I, I spoke to my father to about this yeah. because he's a Presbyterian minister, right? Yeah. <laughs> he said, you know, there's this uh, Protestant belief in its history of. There was this, there in its development. There was this um, fear of conflating art with God, or or the fear of the art being worshipped and pointing people away from going within. That that was kind of like I'm trying to paraphrase what he said in Korean, <laughs> <laughs> but but that was kind of the fear. But at the same time, the whole if you read what the iconographists wrote in their own diaries, they, they believe that art was a transcendental mirror that it kind of points you back in. So it's like there's two different things going on here. And I mean, obviously, as a painter, you know, I'm going to take the latter, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, because then I could feel in better service. Right. But um, yeah. that, that is something that I've noticed, you know, about this, the, uh, the Protestant relationship to aesthetics. There seems to be this feeling that, well, we don't want to. Um, we don't want to get lost in the aesthetics and conflate that with, with worship or with God. Mm -hmm. But with that said, I think that those who are against God, those who are for sin, those who want to destroy beauty are taking advantage of aesthetics. Mm -hmm. They are. And they're using it against your children. So, I don't know. I think, I think you should let the artists who declare themselves as Christians and they recognize Jesus as king and mm -hmm. they, they, they want to protect the same things that, that they believe in that you also confide in. Um, I think you should let them, um, you should support them, right? I, it's mm -hmm. really interesting because, like, I, I, mean, I, I mean, I'll tell you that... Um, our, our art is so much stronger. It, that's another thing, and we shouldn't be afraid of that. It, it's it's interesting, you know. Mm -hmm. I've I've had that uh, conversation with both of my parents actually because they're deeply Christian community mm -hmm. people. Like my father's a senior pastor and all that, and uh, so yeah, I, I, th there's this underlying fear of 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 it being blasphemous. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's I, I don't fully uh, I don't fully understand it. It's something that I think we have to you know. There's parts of things that we need to reconnect with. Yeah, um, I, I think. Um, how, how did you get interested in studying art in the first place? So, as I told you, my father's a minister, and he was always into religion and philosophy. And my mother, she's a uh, composer. Mm -hmm. And she has a dissertation in music theory, uh, university mm -hmm. level. And uh, I often, I always try to look at my roots so I can give a, a sincere answer on this. And I think that that was sort of like the nesting, right? Where I'm exploring 
what they would always like, like, like they're both of their interests synergizing visually. Mm-hmm. <laughs> there's, there's something of that sort going on. Not to, not to say it's like one plus one is two, you know, I'm my own person and all that, <laughs> but there, there, there's something of that sort that was like the seed was planted. And I think that in conjunction to the fact that, um, often when people say they're introverts, it's just because they're not, they don't have social skills and they're not confident. Mm-hmm. But like, like I do public speaking, like I'm not, I'm, I'm not a shy guy, but I do feel temperamentally I have an introverted side to me. And I think everything that I've been successful in, I've been, I, I, I've been really thinking about this because I have success in martial arts too. And I've been thinking about this and everything that I've been successful in has been so individual. Hmm. That's something I've come to realize. I never done team sports. I always did wrestling, boxing, judo, taekwondo. I hmm. always did individual things. And that's the same spirit I feel like in my painting where it's on me, right? It's like, I don't need to worry about this person dropping the ball over here. <laughs> you hmm. know, and I think there's something that I was attracted to in that regard. And I think that's another reason why there's no way with that context that could have stayed in the gallery. You know, mm. because they want you to be a part of a certain kind of roster, and a guy like me cannot stay in there. You know, it's interesting that you talk about your dad and your mom, um, because uh, my mom's side of the family is very, very, very creative. My brother is an actor and a uh, and a graphic designer, uh, and my cousin is a uh, painter and and works for a you know a, a big art school. Um, I have another cousin who plays in a symphony orchestra in California. My uncle, I mean, all these people, super, super creative and all in different ways. And my own, my own creativity, if you want to call it that, I would say, I would never say I was artistic, but my, I, I express myself through writing and through sort of intellect and, uh, sort of the architecture of ideas, uh, if you will. So I think there probably is something that your mom's composing, your dad's preaching and intellectual there's a creative creative element of that that expresses itself visually through what you do. I, I really do think so. You know, um, you know, every artist and this applies to yourself as a writer too, mm-hmm. right? Every, everyone who is yielding an artistic medium, they become like personal sama layers almost of everything mm-hmm. that's influenced them. And they kind of distill it into their medium, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. And for me, it's, yeah, it's, it's this potion of my, my, my father's religious and philosophical teachings, my mother always throwing the classics at me, I mean, to the point where it was annoying, <laughs> uh, my martial art training, um, the, the cultural climate we're in, and, and that making me want to overemphasize things that are underemphasized. Like there, there's a lot of, there's a lot of these different moving parts that has made me step up in, in the, the branding that people now know me um, and identify my art through. What did your parents think when you went into painting? Yeah. You're asking a Korean guy this, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, well they, they, you know, in Korean, like, First of all, I'm an American. I want to make that clear. Yeah. I, people always say, like, people ask me a lot of these uh, Korean questions and all mm-hmm. this. And, and I get it. You know, I get it. You know, I still have I mean, this you could, be, you could be an American and your parents, you know, you become an artist. They always like, oh, man, why don't you become an accountant? Or why don't you be, go to be a doctor? They yeah, yeah. Want to, they want you to do something practical that's going to make money. Like, that's how I come at it from, like, that America. Their parents always want you to go get a practical skill that pays. Well, well, you know what? I, I, I hate to say it, but, like, I'm, I never was – um, this is another part too. When you asked me earlier, what made me become an artist? Mm-hmm. I said all the good stuff. Now let me see the bad reason why, because nothing's ever always good or bad. Mm-hmm. They say you shouldn't put all your eggs in one basket, right? I, only, I think I only had this one egg too. <laughs> <laughs> I was an okay student. I was doing fine, you know, but I was really excelling in fighting and painting. And they're actually similar for me. They seem very different, especially the the level of the the the, the feel seems so so different on the other ends of the world. But with painting, I realize I can be 
like this warrior in the realm of ideas where I can proclamate certain imagery in the culture that would either trigger certain people or attract others. And I realized that if I continue to work on this at an early age, if I continue to work on this, I would get the stage to do so. And that's kind of, that's, I think I would not have been able to articulate it that way looking back in retrospect, but I think that's what would, the attraction was to it. Like this idea of rather than picking up a sword, I'm picking up a brush, but, mm -hmm. I'm, but I'm influencing, you know, the pen is mightier than sword, right? Mm -hmm. Well, the brush for me is mightier than the pen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's sort of the, uh, the, the language that, that um, I think I was attracted to, you know. Mm -hmm. What's it like studying art in school? You went to art school, right? So what was that? Oh yeah. What is it like to go to art school as opposed to like a red traditional college? Well, look, I, I believe in higher education. I want to make that clear because I know that a lot of people, a lot of higher education is garbage today. But depending on the right training, you know, it's, it's there. And most of higher education in, in the visual arts, at least, it is, it's a lot of garbage. You know, I, I, mean, I have maybe two professors that I still have relationships with that have really taught me a lot. Mm -hmm. But um, I took a class. I, you have to take so many, you know, humanities classes and like rather than just taking philosophy, psychology, whatever interest, you know, the typical uh, courses that most students would take, there's all these other strange classes like um, like dismantling the patriarchy or, <laughs> uh, you know, or, or uh, um, living in a a cis hetero like all these like it's, it's cling on language kind of stuff like so many mm -hmm. of these kind of classes in arts education because if you think you know the universities are woke go to an art university <laughs> you're ready it's even worse you it's it's the idea of clown world actualizes in front of you it's it's pretty clown bad world actualized <laughs> yes clown world actualized <laughs> i mean i mean uh, there is Oh my God! There, there's the gender bending, the whole, the whole nine yards. It's, it's insane. So me being there, I had to basically keep my mouth shut every day. So when he asked me what was my education like, usually, you know, one of the perks of going to higher education is you meet connections for the rest of your life, right? And people that you can work with. I didn't get any of that. Hmm. I actually got a bunch of enemies, even upon graduation. I was able to graduate just by doing the status quo, right? I had so many people that were like harassing and trying to bully me online, all that crap, um, you know, after graduation. And I couldn't help but realize I'm like, this is the state of the, this is the state of the art world today, you know? And, and those people will probably do well, uh, but under a certain thumb, you know, mm -hmm. but they'll never be able to be independent, mm -hmm. right? They'll never be in the position that I'm in now. <laughs> That's what it is. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I know you believe in training for artists. That yeah, it's not just 100%. about that, that you you have to learn all the, the techniques, all the classics, all the rules before you can really express yourself individually. And the architect Renzo Piano, who uh, designed the modern wing of the Art Institute of Chicago, he mm. had this line that says, creativity doesn't need freedom, it needs rules then you can enjoy breaking those rules from time to time. D do you agree with that? Big thing we say in the Genesis Council, two mm -hmm. mantras in the art making. We repeat this all the time because these are two universalities. When it comes to art making, two things. Mm -hmm. One, you have to learn the rules or break the rules. Mm -hmm. I, I, I had a young man who came up to me saying, hey, I love your art. I, I want to, you to help me produce this artwork that I've been thinking about for so long. It's like him with the symbolic shape of this dragon, all this stuff. And I said, okay, first I need you to grab a bowl, put some fruit in there and draw it. <laughs> and he went, what? <laughs> I'm like, yeah. You know, you, you, can't, you can't just jump to that. Mm -hmm. I love the contextualism, but you have to first get your formalism in line. So beautiful. Keep working on both, but that's the first thing. You need to first learn the rules to break the rules. Second thing, and this is a universality for anyone who's interested in art making, Long-term consistency will beat short-term intensity. Hmm. This applies to training. You look at some of the 
highest level uh, competitors in the jiu-jitsu space, this is how they train. Look at the Chinese weightlifters. This is how they train too. They do every day. They get to a certain point. They don't exhaust themselves to the point where they can't train the next day. Mm -hmm. Because if, if, you, if you trade two hours every day but at a certain consistency without burning yourself out, right, and mm -hmm. then you go twice a week all out, three hours both, who got more hours, mm -hmm. right? So bottom line is it's, it's time. It's time in the market, not time in the market, right? Mm -hmm. and, and that applies to painting as well. You know, I, I remember uh, when I was getting multiple solo exhibitions across the board um, in a single year. Mm -hmm. I had a couple of people contact me. How are, you, how are you getting so many shows? And I contacted them. I said, well, how many hours a week do you paint? And <laughs> he's like, oh, you know, I paint, you know, I, I go twice a week. I'm like, well, don't, you shouldn't be talking to me right now. You know, I'm here beyond nine to five, like, like, because they're not all going to sell, right? Mm -hmm. You need to make, you need to produce a body of work in order to even garner someone's interest. Mm -hmm. So there's just a lot of laziness going on also, but I think there's a laziness going on in conjunction to the fact that men have been told that, and I mean specifically men, not women, mm -hmm. men have been told that it's an unmasculine thing to pursue arts. That's another mm. part of the equation today. Mm. You know, we're going to come back. I want to I take a look at another piece of art. And then okay. I want to come, come back to that because that's like a big, big question I wanted to talk about there. Um, let me pull up another piece here. And uh, let's do that. This huh. is a different looking piece but again extremely striking in the visuals um what can you tell me about this one this was a super popular painting of mine i got so many collectors interested in this work it's t it's a statue study i did at first but then i made it i just kept working the layers to the point where it became its own original it's a um uh a youth uh, a youthful man who's been sliced in half. And I think the attraction to it from my following was that it's a very fitting representation of the times, mm. right? And uh, just a sliced gaze where the background is this feminine pink and it, it, it just, it says a lot without having, having multiple figures, you know, cause I'm usually known for juxtaposing many figures into one. But this one is uh, it stands out for just for just being one central figure, and again, it was a study at first because um, I go to the Met, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, mm -hmm. very often, and this is the first thing you see when you enter the Greek Hall, mm. for a good reason because it's a beautiful statue, and it just I remember the first time I saw this several years ago, I'm like I have to capture this painting, and uh, yeah, and, and I finally got around to it. <laughs> Do you know who the figure is supposed to be of? Uh, oh, we don't know. Okay. And, 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 you know, obviously it was not produced this way. So the fact that it was sliced in mm -hmm. such a clean cut way, it was almost like, like, it's almost like God is telling you, hey guys, this is what's going on right now. <laughs> you know, it was such a clean slice. And, um, yeah, I, I think that's like the underlying feeling from the culture when I got a response about this work. It's like, this is what we're living in today. Yeah, and again, the colors are very powerful. I mean, it's like you, you, you use very unique color combinations that really uh, grab you. Again, I, I showed some of these to my wife last night and we, neither of us could really articulate what the color palette or style of color you're using, but it really, the colors just pop. They come out and grab you. Yeah, I, I was I was sharing that the reason why I do this sort of pop art sensibility of colors that are like so in your face and saturated, there's a functionality behind that. It's almost like, you know, you're in a church like while eating a bag of Skittles. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because what I want people to do, you know, I had a, I had a following where I can influence people, right? So by showcasing my work across these galleries, and I'm trying to make wisdom sexy. You know, I'm trying to make people look at 
these sacred images or these archetypal fundamentals that we should keep in mind with the light of this is this is an attractive thing right and uh yeah that that's that was the intention behind this color composition but i will say as i was also sharing with you in the green room that as i'm evolving and because i don't you know i can um take a segue from what i'm stylistically known for doing i'm going to be lessening the color now a little bit making it a little bit less color, less saturation. So, so people are going to see the, the pre-Christian phase of Arthur's work and a post-Christian phase, and the main distinction will actually probably be color hmm. and certain complexity. And this is something, I mean, I got stacks of sketchbooks. You know, this is something I've been sort of formulating a little bit. I am also taking a hiatus a little bit from uh, uh, my individual, sh like sharing my individual like, like this current project series that I'm working on, I'm not going to be sharing so many of those yet as well. But, uh, yeah. No, that's great. So let me pull this back here. And, uh, yeah, that's really good. I, I got, a, I had a couple questions come in. And I just want to ask these and then we'll get back to the conversation, which sure. I thought they were, I thought they were interesting questions. This one from Bert's book says, does the American privileging of progress over past kind of guarantee a disdain for any common aesthetic taste? Yeah, progressivism, right? Um, hmm, that's that's a really. I think I think there's truth in that, but you know, I, I'm going to refer to one of my influences, Joseph Campbell, again, and he he was quoted saying that uh, the artist must consistently recreate these stories and mythologies and archetypes in new ways, which is really what I'm trying to do again, as I just said, with the color schemes and all this. So I think the problem is that the artist is not hitting the nail on the head because uh, we have too many fake artists in a way mm -hmm. people who are getting success in their artistry without actually having any skill. Right. So yeah. um, I, but I definitely see where you're coming from, Bert. Yeah, and then he had one other question, you know, and I think this came back to when we were talking about Tom Wolfe is when this actually came in. The self-expression and rationalism you're mentioning sounds like the general experience of modernity. Should the function of religious art change with the advent of modernity? You know, I've, I've thought about a lot of this too. I mean, <laughs> I've been speaking to, like, another idea I have. Oh, my God. Um, you, you, you got some things going on in my head here. Yeah. Two things I've wanted to do. One is... With this biblical series that I'm going to start, um, again, I'm not going to publish this process. It's like I'm hiding the sculpture. It's not ready mm -hmm. to show you, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to go on tour with this, you know, and, and I'm going to have to definitely find a patron who wants to um, take this to the next level, right? Because mm -hmm. I got my following, my base, and I could do some galleries with that. But if I want to do it at the level of how these dark artists who are venerated mm -hmm. by the elite mm -hmm. are doing so. I, I, I'm going to have to take that to the next level. But secondly, is uh, I've thought of, we have so many Christian artists in the council and, and starting like a mural program where we do murals on churches with like high, high end art, like just like, that would be amazing. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, so I, I've thought about this as well of having, you know, sort of breaking that mold that we talked about, Aaron, is that, that Protestant, um, you know, uh, constraint on aesthetics that that's holding them back from, you know, that would just draw in young people, by the way. So if mm -hmm. you want to influence people, you know, like, like conservatives and Christians will have been having a hard sell to get young people interested in their content. Mm -hmm. Like, guess what? The artists are there and, um, we're happy to collaborate too, you know, like mm -hmm. it's, it's worth looking into. Well, thanks for those questions there, uh, Bert. You know, you, if, before we looked at your last piece, you were mentioning that society has convinced men that it's not masculine to go into the arts. Uh, and yet you think that, you know, art often comes out of mas masculine energy. Yep. Uh, I think you've got this line that says, masculinity is what produces the greatest works of art. Um, why do you say that? Yeah, every masterpiece requires the capacity to endure suffering, 
your ability to interpret it, analyze it, and to, to share it to the mass. And there is great sacrifice and discipline associated with that. Not that women can't have that quality, but it is a very manly thing to do to take in, take in the soak the world's problems and to analyze in a way and to triumphantly put something as the answer. Like that's a very heroic sort of pattern to mm -hmm. undergo. So, um, yeah, well, you see the same thing in, you know, in extreme sports, um, in many endeavors where, uh, you know, men have really pushed the peaks or the edge, uh, innovating in, in new directions over time. Like, you know, almost all the great composers uh, are male, for example, the great artists. Now, when, you know, the feminists would say that, you know, that's because there's been discrimination and, and all this, which, you know, there, there probably has been some, you know, over the years. But I do think it's, you know, there there is something, you know, I think particularly ma masculine about that attempting, sort of like Achilles or the, the great, you know, go back to this idea of trying to be, uh, you know, almost transcend the limits of human experience through this quest for greatness or something of that nature. Yeah, you know, I, I think my, my, my problem with, um, my, you know, the, the reason why people think the arts are not a masculine pursuit is because, I mean, obviously everything is just connected to the fact that there's an absence of fathers, right? I, I think that's what it is because what happens is um, men are now, here, I'll put it this way. Everyone is actually interested in aesthetics. It's just a matter if you are conscientious of it or not. That's really what it boils down to. Today, mm -hmm. because we live in such a world that does not acknowledge benevolent masculinity and the good that masculinity can have in the arts and aesthetics, what we're doing is we are pursuing uh, the warrior archetype, which is important, but we're doubling down on that instead of the magician as well. Mm -hmm. So, Yeah, can you give people a little background in those Jungian archetypes? Yeah, yeah. Look, look, look at the archetypes as like primordial blueprints. It's almost like there are characteristics that that are beyond imprinting. So if you are born with a desire to to lead or to to uh, to follow, fight or flight, right? Mm -hmm. And those can be manifested as as a king or the servant, right? And you, you are born with this desire to to fight. That's the war. You are born with the desire to create and to be the, the notion of archetypes in psychoanalytical thinking is that to be a holistic person, you need to have proper channels for all of these different sides of you. And it's important to embody that. And, and I, I think today the men who are who do not have a creative outlet, they tend to be people who double down at the gym more than anything. And I'm mm. also big on exercise and I'm 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 in pretty good shape myself. Yeah, but what I, I did think that was interesting, you know, that you're into Taekwondo and all that. It's not just, you're not just a creative guy. You're into the martial arts. Got to be holistic, my man. Mm -hmm. It's important. And I, I guess what I'm saying is that I've noticed often the men who think arts are feminine are so obsessed with the aesthetic of their own bodies because they, they use that same aesthetic energy into the uh, into athletic mm. and, and 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 the warrior modality instead, but they're actually pers pursuing the aesthetic of showing youth and and, and sexual virility. Mm -hmm. But you can actually be pursuing the production of art and substance. Mm -hmm. and, and I think there's everyone is actually aesthetic. It's just a matter of recognizing it and, and understanding where you're channeling those impulses. And I think today, because we no longer have art teachers or, or masculine men at the forefront spotlighted as artists, what's happening now is we're looking at art as like a feminine thing. Even mm -hmm. though historically speaking, 
you open up any art history textbook, you can't help but see like, wow, all the amazing works of art without having any education to interpret it, just at a gut level. You're like, these are all macho men. Mm -hmm. This these art. And it's, it's, they're being very successful at supplanting this narrative, you know, but anybody mm -hmm. who opens an art history book, not something a critic wrote, mm -hmm. not a hit piece, mm -hmm. but just a book with pictures, mm -hmm. right? And then you look at it, oh, the people supporting the greatest works of all time were wealthy patriarchs as patrons, military generals, and <laughs> like, like religious men. Mm -hmm. It's like, hmm, those are all pretty uh, like patriarchal masculine qualities, you know? Yeah, I do think there is such a, an atrophied sense today of what it means to be a man. Your, your approved masculinity is, uh, you know, it's like, uh, you know, beer, bacon, uh, football. Uh, you know, it's almost, there's almost like a pride. Like in, if you're a man, then you can't be very sophisticated. You know, you can't yeah. be too intellectual. You can't be like a college professor. A college professor is not very manly. Uh, you know, you, you kind of have to be kind of, yeah, uh, tattoos, so sports cars yeah. and, and how much beer you can take down. Right. And that's exactly what the left wants you to believe, by the way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you're falling right into it. So if you right. think that's what it is, you're a good old boy. Right. But, but, right. but, you know, the, the reality is that, uh, um, you know, that's, if you believe that, then you're playing into their idea of toxic masculinity mm -hmm. because that, that is what would, I guess you'd classify that. But I, I gotta say, like, um, it's just so frustrating that I keep meeting that sort of trope, because, you know, real real masculinity is is a force of benevolence, and it's your creator, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and the problem with those beer and bacon guys, and I love beer and bacon, by the way, <laughs> but <laughs> but the problem with those guys is that they make women their god and sexuality as prayer. Mm -hmm. And that is the peak of their, uh, of their uh, hierarchical pleasure. And I, th I think for me, it just boils down to, as a man, you need to find something you love more than sex, bottom line. Mm -hmm. And if you have something that you love creatively, then you're going to find a deeper pleasure in life because there's the pleasures of the body, of hedonism, of, of good food and sex, and that's all there to be enjoyed. But the, the pleasure, the greatest pleasure is discipline, mastery of a skill. There's no greater feeling mm -hmm. that you have. Imagine when you go to, when I train, when I, okay, I go to judo every Tuesday and Thursday. Mm -hmm. There's, there are those practices when I leave the mat and my mm -hmm. feet are dragging. Cause you mm -hmm. know, I, you know, I did some work, mm -hmm. right? Like forget about it. You know, that's the same feeling you can get when you are in the studio painting and that flow is just on point. The state mm -hmm. of flow, it's just coming out. You know, it's, it's, it's important to find that and and it's a part of being self-actualized as a man. And I, I think it's, um, it's really critical for men today to find something that they like more than uh, sexual intercourse. Mm -hmm. You're kind of talking more about being a producer than a consumer. Yes. You know, so channeling that. Yeah. You know, I guess Freud talked about sublimating sexual energy into other pursuits, creative pursuits, uh, or that, or, you know, we have a society today that wants to, you know, give you the, the dopamine hit with the porn. You're watching the porn on the internet, you know, and you're, uh, yeah, you're doing all those things, it, but it's very consumption. I, th I do think it, it's very consumption oriented, um, in, in terms of, of, um, uh, of kind of the idea of what it is to be a man. You're, you're kind of defined as a man by the kinds of products that you consume as opposed to what you create to some extent. In today's couldn't culture. couldn't have said it better myself. Um, okay, let me see here. Um, you know how how should um, so many things. So I'm you know I, I have my creativity through my writing, but I'm not a painter, and I'm not you know an expert on painting. How is some as, as men who sort of aren't artists? How should we engage with art and aesthetics? How should we think about that? How does that relate to us <clears throat> in terms of how should we engage with it? Um, I, I think first is um, exposure to artistic mediums. 
there's something that I like. Again, I told you that I don't do the Korean thing, but I'm going to contradict myself and say something, <laughs> that, something that I like about Korean culture is they believe to be a well-rounded person. You should have some kind of artistic discipline mm-hmm. while excelling in your academics and finding a, mm-hmm. a high income career. That's kind of like the, the, the East Asian model. But with that said, I mean, you know, cause they'll throw them into violin and, but they'll usually throw the kids into as many mediums as they can. And because what they want to see is what sticks mm-hmm. like, Oh, you know, Johnny's, uh, he seems to be really doing well with that, uh, with, the that, that, that ceramic wheel over there, like whatever it is, just so that they, but, but usually they limit it to just to have a fulfilling life and they'll never want them to pursue it as a career. Mm-hmm. That's another part of the conversation. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but, uh, I think it's first finding your medium, recognizing there's no such thing as medium superiority, but there is medium specificity. If you want to capture life as it is and really capture moments and, and share a story analogous to those images, photography. If you want to capture a certain sort of vibration that speaks, uh, that kind of bends reality a little bit while showing movement that's connected to the body, maybe painting. If you know, there's, there's, there's there's different ways, but you have to delve into these different materials and experience the material. And then mm-hmm. you get training with that. That's really, that's, that's the first thing you need exposure to different arts that attract you and you're going to feel it. You might be watching somebody shredding a guitar and then your friend next to you will go, that's a nice riff. But mm-hmm. you might be thinking, Ooh, I've, I've, I've mentally been there before or something like I want to, mm-hmm. I want to, um, explore that you know and maybe mm-hmm. you take those guitar lessons your neighbor has been bothering you about for so long you know i don't know what the medium is but exposure to medium is important i get so excited getting other men to just find their artistic medium it's not even about monetizing just finding it because they're going to get so much pleasure out of it they're going to like you're going to get a different high right like it's it's the best drug <laughs> and I, I get so much pleasure in that it seems to be one thing that has become popular today is sort of woodworking or like building your own oh, furniture. Woodworking is so nice. Yeah. So like what, you know, one of my friends from college, who's like an IT guy, like I was a former IT guy, you know, he started like building like woodworking stuff. He's like, Oh, here's a table I built that I'm doing now. And, and it, you know, woodworking it's more, is it's more a of a practical, it's practical, but there's an aesthetic dimension to it. There's a physical dimension to it. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, when you're sanding that wood down mm-hmm. and it just has a nice grain mm-hmm. and you set it up so that the purple heart oak is actually connecting to that mm-hmm. different grain just smoothly. Mm-hmm. And then and then once it's smooth, you seal it and it dries and it's just like mm-hmm. like like that. Th- those mm-hmm. connections, like you can feel your brain chemistry changing. It's like looking at a work of like it, it's 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 a beautiful thing. Once you can start getting like really finding your art, finding your medium. You don't need to make money off of it. You're, the value will speak for itself by the art itself because it's psychologically speaking. You can see somebody at a concert that's stoned out of their mind off some substance and out, externally you just see some, like, the, some guy who looks like a degenerate and he is, by the way. But in mm-hmm. his mind, I'm using this just as an example, mm-hmm. he's in bliss, right? When, you're, when you are in the trenches of your art making and you've gotten to the point where you've, you've put in your time, you have put in the technical skills, you are in a head state and you are in a flow that there's other things connected there that other people can't see. When I'm painting, uh, I'm in my own world, man. I'm in mm-hmm. a different reality tunnel. And most people will just see that, oh, he's, he's picking up some red paint, he's painting. Mm-hmm. It looks cool. It looks, you know, uh, you know, it looks like entertainment and all that, but it's, it's the greatest pleasure finding an artistic medium and yielding it and developing your own voice on it. Mm-hmm. Forget about it, man. So, mm-hmm. so, I mean, I think that's the first thing. That bug has to bite you because when it does, you realize, ah, oh, wow, like that sounds, I mean, it's it's fun in the best way. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not like, um, it's not circle jerk fun of junk food and pornography. Mm-hmm. It's fun where you are creator, but you're going to have a lot of pride associated with it. And I think that's the first thing because men were built to seek actual pride. We're meant for that. Not ego, like the actual pride of, I'm proud of how this turned out. I did it right and I stepped my game up and I challenged myself mm-hmm. and then I got there. That accomplishment mm-hmm. is so important for men and doing it creatively is the cake. Mm-hmm. Well, I want to show one last piece of art and then I have a final question for you. 
And let me uh, again uh, pull up the screen share here. And uh, which one do I get? Or is it random? <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to figure out which one I. I sure. made a list of which uh, which ones in order. Ah, yes. And this is one. Um, My most popular painting, yeah. Yeah, that this is another super striking piece uh, that I, I guess has some of that archetypal uh, uh, Jungian. This one embodies the warrior completely. Yeah. Yeah, we have uh, the author of The Art of War, Sun Tzu, at the top there in the mm -hmm. center. There's an unknown samurai there to his right. Mm -hmm. um, I saw the samurai, took a picture of it at the Met also. Mm -hmm. um, the preserved condition means he's very high ranking though. Mm -hmm. Is William Wallace to the left in the chainmail, Genghis Khan under him. Julius Caesar at the bottom, Kim Yushin, and this like sort of circular shape around him that becomes like a Leonidas Spartan shield. Mm -hmm. And in conjunction to all these authorities are apex predators. The soaring hawk is above mm -hmm. the samurai. There's a brown bear above William Wallace. There is a killer whale at the bottom and that explosive in your face red Siberian tiger. Yeah. So this is like a composition of pure warrior aggressive energy mm -hmm. it's kind of crazy <laughs> it's wild side arthur Conley painting here yeah that's it's very powerful that tiger is really just oh it looks like he's looking right in your eyes man like he's coming for you yeah notice he's the only <laughs> one with pupils hmm so he's get so the gaze is uh enunciated in contrast you know if, if you see a if you see a uh, uh, a large bucket and there's 30 blue balls in there and there's one orange ball in there where's your eye going to go right mm -hmm. the orange ball so you can always play with contrast both visually and contextually and i do that it's and then what i said with the colors i do that you know now you have eight eight orange balls and then six green balls and then so i'm, I'm always playing this intense puzzle and trying to stack these layers together in a way where i can do as much as i can in a moment great and um, when I was kind of doing my research on you before I, I had this, I watched the interview you did not that long ago with Jack Murphy. And there's another oh, great interview. People can, can go watch that. Jack Murphy Live, Arthur Kwan Lee. If you just Google that, it, it'll bring you right to it. And you made a very interesting statement that I kind of want to close with here and just ask you to explain. You said, if we lose our sense of beauty, we're going to come back and be monsters. Uh, what were you talking about there? And uh, how, how does our, our sense of beauty relate to us as monsters? Or yeah, there's there's a lot to say with that. And in my inter my uh, my conversation with Jack Murphy, I brought up how in World War II there was the bombing of Hiroshima. But also on that list was Kyoto and Nagasaki. And the older men, the older generals, during this meeting stood up and they removed Kyoto on the list. Mm. And they wanted to really enunciate and make clear that that beauty in Kyoto, those traditional Japanese aesthetic, all that, something that you travel the world to see, right? We cannot lose that beauty because it's one thing to win by any means, but it's quite another thing to lose our sense of humanity and beauty is associated deeply with that. And currently in the climate that we are in, we have totally lost our sense of beauty, which gives, which hands all our power to the collectivist. Mm -hmm. Because you see the left and the right, they're having a fight here. Like wh however you want to put it, you see this, this, this argumentation and this battle coming on here. But I think people are losing, you know, we're not listening to the ancients. As you're having a fight here, the side that has beauty behind them, the other side will recognize that beauty and it will do two things. One, it will bring all of those on the fence onto their fold. And two, it will show them that we are, it will not only remind us, but it will show the other side of what we're fighting for. And that is a nucleus that we are losing touch with. 
Well, Arthur, thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to to speak with me today. Again, it's Arthur Kwan Lee, Christian artist in New York City. Uh, you can Google him. You can go to ArthurKwanLee.com. He's also at Arthur Kwan Lee on Instagram if you want to check him out there. I think that's your handle everywhere. So uh, Arthur Kwan Lee across the board. If you yeah. are a art collector or a lover of art, so you want to put some art on your walls, as everyone here should, by the way, um, whether it's my art or not, I'm a big – support of collect some art you can find me on arthur Kwan Lee on all platforms but if you are a creative person who wants to be a part of the discussion on taking the culture back you check out the genesis council in turn so um those are my two uh spots man aaron yeah, you are a yeah. beautiful man and i think you actually do sell uh limited edition prints on your site too so you don't have to be mega bucks uh to buy one of your original paintings you know <laughs> so check it out thank you very much arthur god bless you aaron thank you for your time